Hello everyone, my name is Isabel Moore and I will be talking about the cognitive psychology area. To tell you a little bit more about me, I'm a third year graduate student in cognitive psychology and my advisor is Dr. Nicole Long. I'm really interested in and excited about the neural mechanisms that underlie memory encoding and memory retrieval in humans. And I decided to apply to graduate school because I was really interested in this question of how does the brain support these really complex memory functions. And because I went into graduate school applications with this question in mind, I applied only to cognitive psychology programs because I already knew that I wanted to study human memory specifically. I chose UVA over other programs for two main reasons. Um, the first was that my advisor and her work was a really strong was a really strong fit for my interests. And the second is that I really liked the institutional environment here at UVA. Um, when I interviewed here, the current graduate students were really friendly and there was an emphasis on collaboration, um, which all really lined up with what I was looking for. So what exactly is cognitive psychology? Um, it's the studying of mental processes. So things like memory, attention, perception, among others. Um, but you can just think of it as the science of how we think. And the cognitive psychology area here has some basic competencies that you complete at each stage of the program. So every year you present your work at the cognitive area meetings, also known as Cog Lunch. Cog Lunch is a weekly meeting with everyone in the cognitive area, so that's faculty, uh, grad students, postdocs, um, and we meet to discuss journal articles and hear from speakers and provide each other with feedback. During the first year, you complete a general exam of your knowledge for cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience topics. During the second year, you complete a pre-dissertation which I will discuss in um, more detail later. During the third year, you complete a qualifying exam, which is comprised of a grant proposal and then an oral defense of that proposal. During the fourth year, you propose your dissertation. So this is the project or projects that will cap off your graduate training. And then to graduate, you defend all the work that you did for your dissertation. So here are some basic course requirements for the cognitive psychology area. Um, during your first and second years, you typically complete 12 credits per semester, which is about two to three classes. And that includes a two semester series of statistics courses, which is required of all psychology gradu graduate students, um, not just the cognitive area. And then to complete the master's degree, you need a total of 30 credits. Um, but that includes credits that you get from participating in COG Lunch and from topical research, which is just the research that you already are doing in your advisor's lab. So you get credit for that. During the third year, you will typically be done with coursework and will instead focus on your research. Then to complete the PhD, you need a total of 72 credits, um, which includes the 30 credits that you completed for the master's degree, as well as credits that you get from your research. So here's an example of courses that you might take during the fall of your first year. Um, I'll also note that Psych 7501 is Cog Lunch and Psych 9501 is Topical Research. So again, these are just earning credits for the things that you already have to do. Your pre-dissertation, which is the same as your master's thesis, is a research paper based on all the work you do during your first and second years. Um, this is due by August 15th of your second year, so right before you start your third year. Your advisor and a second reader, which is another faculty member in the cognitive psychology area, will read it and approve it. And then once it's approved, if you have all the credit requirements that you need, you can now get your master's degree. Um, my pre-dissertation project utilized scalp EEG, or electroencephalography, um, to investigate the mechanisms that underlie the ability to encode words during a free recall memory task. And that paper is currently under review for publication. Um, so typically, after you write your master's thesis, you'll submit it for publication. 
So again, my name is Isabel Moore. I'm more than happy to talk to you all more about the cognitive psychology area. This is my email and my Twitter. Um, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody, and welcome to UVA's Diversifying Psychology Visit Day. My name is Jessica Gettleman, and I'm a graduate student in the cognitive area. So specifically, I'm a fourth year grad student in Chad Dodson's lab or the Dodson Cognition Lab. And my research interests are both basic and applied. So I'm interested in the development of false memories, as well as the relationship between confidence and accuracy for episodic memory. So after you make um, a memory decision, you can be asked to indicate how confident you are in that decision. And I'm interested in how well that com those confidence ratings predict the actual accuracy of your identification. So how well you're able to use confidence to assess accuracy across multiple different trials and in multiple different paradigms, and specifically in individual difference factors that affect how predictive your confidence ratings actually are. Um, and that relates to my main applied interest, which is the bulk of the work I've done in graduate school on eyewitness memory, because confidence is the most important factor that judges and jurors are asked to consider when assessing the reliability of an eyewitness identification. So I'm interested in you know, the confidence accuracy relationship um, for lineup identification, so in an eyewitness memory paradigm specifically. And I'm also interested in memory and aging. So memory changes and typically gets worse with age, even for older adults who are experiencing healthy aging. And there are key differences between the episodic memory of younger versus older adults. So I'm interested in studying those. So studying episodic memory changes across the lifespan and also in how confidence judgments for memory decisions differ between these two age groups. So due to these interests, I applied to graduate school because of mostly this interest in memory, but also a broader interest in cognitive psychology in general, especially in areas that are related to memory, such as attention and decision-making. And also I've always had this interest in eyewitness memory and other intersections between psychology and the law. And towards the end of graduate school, after working in multiple research labs, I realized that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to research and teach these topics. So pursuing a PhD made sense. And specifically, I applied to all cognitive psychology PhD programs. Um, I applied to 10 programs and they were all like UVA cognitive psychology PhD programs through, you know, a graduate school of arts and sciences at various institutions. And of all the programs that I got into, I selected UVA primarily due to Chad, my current advisor's research interests, because he studies both eyewitness memory and memory and aging, which can, tip, can typically be kind of separate topics that aren't necessarily studied together in the same lab. So I liked that I had the opportunity to study both of these areas that I knew were kind of my, my main research interests. And he was also interested with both of those um, in the role of memory confidence and how predictive that is of older and younger adults, general memory and specifically episodic memory decisions. So that was a perfect fit for my research interests. And in addition to that, the graduate students, not just in the cognitive area, but across the entire department were incredibly kind and welcoming. And I liked that it really seemed to be a collaborative instead of a competitive environment. So graduate students really supported each other and you know lended their expertise when, when it could be helpful um, and we're, we're super willing to help everybody everybody else in the program and we're genuinely excited for other folks successes so that just seemed like a, a really healthy environment um, in which to pursue my graduate education and that's still true today i still feel four years into the program i still um, feel that uva psychology graduate students um, kind of exhibit that still uh, so that was really um, two of the main reasons why uh, I chose UVA's program. So in the program, um, during your um, third and fourth year, so typically starting your the end of your third year through the summer going into your and then going into the fall semester of your fourth year, you complete what are known as comps, comprehensive exams, and they're actually changing right now in cognitive in the cognitive area. But um, what I did for my comps, which I just completed um, in August of this of this school year um, was writing a review paper. So I reviewed the literature and wrote, you know, kind of an extensive review paper on a topic that's relevant to my research interests. So this topic was actually about reaction time. 
for eyewitness memory and for eyewitness lineup and identifications. So how long it takes to make an identification from the lineup between when it's put on the screen and when you make your decision and uh, how that relates to eyewitness accuracy and specifically different variables that would moderate this relationship. So how is the relationship between reaction time and identification accuracy different, for example, for identifications made with high confidence versus low confidence. So that, um, that was an interesting project to undertake and that was the review paper I wrote. Um, the second part was creating a syllabus for a course you're designing. So instead of being like a typical service course, like intro to cognition, for example, this was designed to be a um, kind of seminar style course for upper level undergraduates on a specific topic related to your, your research and teaching interests. And so you have to create the syllabus for the course with the, the idea that hopefully this, if this would be a course that you'd be interested in teaching in the future. So I designed a writing intensive course about applications of episodic memory. So two of the topics discussed were eyewitness memory and memory and aging, as well as uh, you know memory and learning. So uh, memory and how it relates to like, studying for exams, for example. Um, so that was my syllabus. And the third portion is reviewing a paper, which reviewing a manuscript that has been submitted by another team of researchers to a journal is something you'll start to do as a graduate student, but that would be a decent part of your kind of your your day to day job as a faculty member if you went into academia. So this is typically a paper that your advisor, a manuscript that your advisor has been sent to review for a journal. So I reviewed a paper that had been sent to Chad to review and Chad reviewed it as well. And we kind of compared our reviews and then he incorporated parts of, of my review into his actual formal review that he sent back to the journal about this manuscript. So uh, this is kind of what comps has looked like for me. How it's changing is not exactly determined yet, but what the, the area is looking at is that instead of the review paper aspect, so the other aspects would mostly stay the same, but instead of writing a review paper, you could um, write a grant application since that involves you know, a review of the literature as well, um, in addition to you know, planning out experiments and discussing preliminary results or potential results um, from those studies. Um, or you could take a test that has a, both a written and an oral portion that's meant to assess breadth of knowledge in all of cognitive psychology. So to prepare for this exam, it encourages to, you to review the literature kind of broadly throughout the entire field of cognitive psych instead of just in your specific area. So kind of based on what would be the best fit for what would help you the most um, in terms of the career that you want to pursue and what you want to get out of comps, uh, you, you definitely would have a choice in kind of which avenue you wanted to go down. So um, after you complete comps, you begin your dissertation. So I'm just starting my dissertation work and my, my dissertation work is in, involves both basic based recognition paradigms, as well as eyewitness paradigms. So paradigms where um, you're tested just, you know, kind of, did you see this face or not? And you're presented with a single face, that would be a basic example, as well as um, when you're presented with a kind of an ecologically valid lineup and you're asked to, you know, make identification from that lineup as if you were a mock witness um, based on the faces that you'd seen before. So with both of those paradigms, um, we, are asking participants to provide judgments of learning or JOLs, which is where we ask them to indicate how likely they think it is that they'll be able to remember each presented face, so each individual stimulus on a later test. And typically these judgments of learning are assessed numerically. So participants, you know, on a numeric scale of like, you know, ranging from like zero to 100% confidence and like six point intervals. So like zero, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100% confident. You know how how confident are you that you'll be able to remember this on a later test? Um, but uh, the novel component of my dissertation is um, asking these questions uh, verbally as well. So asking um, participants to provide to in their own words indicate how likely they think they are to remember the space later on, and then also to provide a justification for that verbal judgment of learning in which they're asked to provide specific details about why they indicated that level of confidence. So they'll say things like, oh, we have to definitely be able to pick him out of the lineup, his eyes and nose really stood out, or, oh yeah, I'll be able to remember her, I think she looks like my cousin, or I don't, I'm not confident in my ability to remember this person because I don't, I'm not good with faces in general. So we're interested um, in kind of, first of all, does this verbal information 
Um, is it valuable for predicting the eventual accuracy of those identifications above and beyond just the numeric JOL itself? And if so, what type of information, so kind of which of those categories of information that I, that I discussed, um, when, when it's provided after viewing a face but before responding to a lineup would be most predictive of correct eyewitness identifications. Um, and this would be with the overall goal of you know, providing law enforcement with kind of a guide that they can use about information that you know, when a witness uh, references specific facial features, it's you know, more or less likely to lead to a correct identification than if they mention familiarity um, or, or whatever it may be. So that's kind of an exciting project, and um, I'll be using machine learning analyses to analyze these text-based JL responses, which is another novel component of the dissertation. So after you finish your dissertation and get your PhD, the most common career paths for folks with, with a PhD in cognitive psychology are pretty similar to what the common career paths would be for a PhD in, in another area of psychology in that it's um, academia is, is very common. So um, whether it's at a, a large research institution or a small liberal arts college, going into academia to be a faculty member and run your own research lab and also you know, teach undergraduate and graduate students. Um, aside from industry, er, aside from academia, industry is common. And the most common industry positions for cognitive psych PhDs um, are data science positions. So where you're using where you're conducting research and using your, the data analysis skills you've learned in getting your PhD to answer research questions that are important to whatever co company or corporation that you work for. And another option is government jobs um, in which you would also be involved in you know, carrying out research projects, uh, but could also contribute to you know, public policy work and decisions um, in a content area that's either you know, could be similar to the content area um, in which you earned your PhD, or it could be different and more related to just cognitive psychology on a broader level. Um, and an example of, of a position that, of an industry position that, you know, I would be kind of like a dream job for me that I would be interested in going into would be an example in which the content area is very close to what I'm studying for my PhD in serving as the Director of Data Science and Research for the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project is the largest nonprofit legal organization in the country dedicated to exonerating folks who have been wrongfully convicted. So individuals who are um, have been convicted of a crime they did not commit and are currently serving sentences for that crime. And uh, actually eyewitness misidentifications are responsible for 75% of these wrongful convictions. So the work I'm doing now would be very relevant to this work that I, you know, in this example for this job would be doing for the Innocence Project with the hope of reducing eyewitness misidentifications and therefore reducing wrongful convictions and also helping to exonerate as quickly as possible folks who are serving sentences for crimes they did not commit. So I hope that that was helpful and gave you an idea of what it's like to be a cognitive psychology PhD student at UVA, as well as what you can do with that degree upon graduation. I've provided my contact information here, both my email and my Twitter handle, please feel free to contact me either way. I'm more than happy to elaborate on anything I've discussed in this presentation or answer any questions you have about applying to psychology PhD programs in general, or especially cognitive psychology PhD programs. And I've also included the social media information for UVA psychology department in case you'd like to follow them on any of those platforms. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of your visit day.